not Shana Faskin. <laughs> she fell ill and sorry for you I get to fill in because it would have been a little bit better to hear her but I'll do what I can for you. If you throw any produce because you're irritated with me please throw nutrient dense produce at me. <laughs> yeah. If you're familiar with Weston Price then you probably understand what I'm talking about. Um, it's going to be a brief overview just about um, who Weston Price was and what he did. And I'm using the notes that Shana developed again, so it may be a little choppy, and I apologize for that uh, ahead of time, but I'll do what I can do. Um, there we go. Um, I, I am basically, I'm here in Columbia and I am kind of a homestead farmer. I do several different things, but I grow what I can for our family. We raise chickens and I have lots of other aspirations as far as farming goes. But I have over the years, I, I knew Ron, I worked with him and on his place and I kind of pushed to bring Weston Price together with uh, the small farm trade show because they go hand in hand in the 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 little saying of Weston Price is wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. And obviously food, nutrition, and farming, you cannot separate them. Um, and if you know anything about Weston Price, he was a dentist and a researcher. And um, he was in the 1930s is when, when he was about. And he did a 10-year period of research on uh, different people groups. Um, where he, he, let me back up, he noted, he noted about the increase in dental decay and deformed dental arch, crowded teeth, and degenerative diseases and personality disorders in, in the Western culture. And he heard a lot of reports uh, from anthropologists about these groups of people that had these perfect teeth and these isolated populations. And his idea was that um, he wanted to look and see what this was about. You know, they were, um, he wanted to find out if it was true and was, was diet a, a responsible factor in, in this. Because, of course, it was thought by some people that it was just um, a genetic thing that occurred in people. Um, so he did research in how the diets of these people that had these genetic structures, um, how they came about. And he was unable to find the healthy group in, these, in our civilized cultures and civilized cultures in general. So he had to go to these remote areas. Uh, and he traveled to these isolated people groups with these primitive diets and these traditional diets versus these so-called civilized foods. I apologize, I'm pretty much kind of reading it. I'll add in where I can. Um, but um, since none of these groups studied were completely isolated, because even at that time, no one was perfectly isolated from the rest of the world. And of course, now we've come to even greater um, place in that area. And they could be examined to a point of contact where they came in with modern civilization and the changes that associated with the new foods in their culture. Um, I'll, I'll put this up, show this to you right now. I don't know if this is a proper place, but he wrote this book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, which is kind of a compilation of his study. Really compelling read. Um, if you have interest in this stuff, you want to get this book. I have not even been through it all the way. I've been involved for years with Weston Price. Uh, but just in the very beginning thing, it's mind-blowing um, things that he had discovered about um, the diet in regard to physical degeneration and health. Um, 
some of the problems that we have in our our culture and westernized food is white flour products, sugar. That would be bleached sugar. There are some sugars that are better for you. Um, white plain cane sugar or beet sugar, the things that we all, you know, if we're concerned about health, we tend to avoid um, polished rice where the germ is removed and um, it's just the starch is basically what is left over, jams, canned foods, and vegetable fats, which is very uh, controversial from the Weston Price perspective. Um, he studied these groups that were isolated in Switzerland villages and Gaelic and outer inner Hebrides and Eskimos, the Inuits of Alaska, the Indians of North, far north and west central Canada and western United States and Florida. Anyway, studied, I, I won't go all through this list for the sake of time because I could probably carry on too long. But you see a very wide variety of people groups that he studied and if you haven't been over to the booth, there's a real good um, um, bo a board there of some of the different pictures of these people groups and some of the genetic um, characteristics that they have um, because of the way they live. And he lived among these people for a period of time and examined and he took pictures of their teeth and took how uh, their, they didn't have dental caries and how their dental arches were formed. and. Um, <clears throat> recorded what they consumed, what they ate. And I sent sam samples of their foods back to the United States for nutritional analysis. Oh, there's the book. Um, I was just a hair ahead. But this is the book that I was just showing you. I'm glad I didn't know that it was going to be in there. But um, you want to take a look at that if you have an interest, an interest in this topic. It's, it's just amazing. I, I had a hard time putting it down. I, I had one day where I had some duty where I just sat and I read and read and read and read and and I don't have many days like that where I sit because I got a lot of chores. Um, tooth decay is controlled by nutrition and, and most honest people in the dental um, <clears throat> um, in the dental what's the profession. We'll, we'll openly tell you that. I mean, not everyone um, necessarily will um, because there are some, maybe some politics involved, but I know several dentists that, that will tell you, and, and I had discussions with my hygienist when I first started to get into this about fluoride and the use of fluoride for um, prevention of dental caries, and I said, well, if we did, if we had a proper diet, and proper um, nutrition, we really wouldn't need to use fluoride. And she agreed that fluoride was kind of the fix for the situation that we are in in the Western. And I would argue personally that it maybe isn't really a fix. Um, so dental health is kind of a picture of, an o of the overall physical health. It, what happens in your dental health is pretty much a, um, a marker for what is going on inside physically, but and emotionally. Um, and we have so many situations in our culture today where people are being medicated with pills for depression or um, mental and emotional problems. And, and I, I wonder, as I look through all this, how nutrition relates in all those circumstances. I have some friends that are really in, in bad shape. I mean, they can't hardly function in society. And of course, the answer is some, th something that comes in a bottle and not let's back up and understand what's going on in the biological system that is the body. Um, so in other words, the teeth are this visual indicator, which is what I was just saying. Um, and it, it, is a, it is a direct sign, the dental caries, cavities in the teeth for this physical de degeneration that is occurring. And there's a complex science to explain it, but um, I don't know if I'm the guy to do, go through all of that, but, but it, it, it is the outward sign of how mineral absorption is from our food and how it is metabolized in the body and the chemical reactions for absorption causes um, these problems. It's, it's more or less 
um, a, a mineral and a calcium problem than it is necessarily a sugar problem or you know some outside thing that's causing that. Now obviously all of those play a role, um, but they had deformities of their feet, it says the pelvis, and a tendency toward degenerative diseases, tuberculosis, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and arthritis. And everyone in the United States would, should probably sit on the edge of their seat at that point, because we're plagued by these things. In my opinion, there's an answer, and it's not necessarily what is being um, proposed by the medical industry as a whole. I'm grateful for what the medical industry does because I probably wouldn't have two of my children and possibly a wife if it wasn't for the medical, um, the things that they do through medical science. Um, but there's another approach to, to this aspect of it. They had difficult childbirth and, and you think about a moral deterioration and mental disorders like as I was talking about. Um, So this is a chart that basically shows um, <clears throat> how the teeth were affected by uh, uh, compared to primitive diet to modernization. You see a drastic um, difference in percentage of what happened there um, to their teeth and the caries that were present in, in their teeth when they came to um, modern diets. Okay, and this slide here is talking about how um, the calcium was uh, four times uh, uh, and other minerals at least ten times the fat-soluble vitamins and large increase in water-soluble vitamins compared to modern diets. The way we process our foods is eliminating a, a lot of what we need. I mean, that's why I made the comment, if you're going to throw produce, please throw nutrient-dense produce at me because even in our agriculture systems, we are struggling to produce food that have the nutrients that it need because of soil depletion. Um, so it's a complex issue, but I, I do believe that there is hope. I mean, it's going to take a lot of work, uh, a lot of commitment. And these are more charts um, here of breakdowns of the different minerals and vitamins. And I'm kind of probably going pretty quickly through that, but I don't know how to deal with that exactly during this talk. Um, so fat-soluble sol vitamins are A and D and E and K and K1 and K2, and they're found mostly in, in the fat in eggs and organs of animals. And vitamin E and K1 are the only ones found in plant fats. Um, One of the, the, the overtones of some of the stuff that you're going to hear, especially if you're talking to me at the booth, is the importance of fat. Now, we've had this campaign for many years. Last night when I came home from the show, we were, I was with my parents and my children because they were taking care of my children so I could be here. And my wife works nights on the weekends. So. And we had um, PBS on, and we had Julia Child, and we were getting a kick out of her because she's quite a funny lady. and. And uh, it was a black and white film. I mean, we're trying to date when this thing was recorded in the 50s or when I'm probably going to say something stupid, like when was the television invented? I don't even know. I don't really pay attention to the TV mostly. But it was in black and white. And, and she was talking about the use of heavy cream in her thing. And she had made the comment, if you're not concerned about your weight, so that was like in the 50s, right? Am I, I mean, if you know, yell out and say, hey, you're a knucklehead. It was in the 60s or something. Um, I won't be offended by it. Uh, I don't take myself too seriously about that. But, but she made the comment about heavy cream being a problem back then. So this campaign has been going on for a long time um, that fats are bad. And it's absolutely the opposite from my experience, not just what I read, but putting this stuff into practice in my life. Um, so we have efficient dairy products of various species, cow, goat, sheep, camel, musk ox. I've never had any camel dairy products or musk ox, but I have an open mind. Um, 
Um, we are at the small farm trade show, and there's lots of different stuff going on here. Um, organs of animals and wild and domestic bird eggs, and uh, I'm, I'm a hunter. I like to take wild game. I don't know if the wild game that I have now is what I could have had years ago. No, because we have all these GMO fields and different things that play into what product we end up with. We have animal life of the sea, fish, fish organs, fish eggs, shellfish and organs, sea, whale, etc. Small animals and insects. Um, a funny story, um, I kind of kidding my children about um, you know, being able to eat different things and talked about how you could eat grasshoppers. According to Levitical law and the Bible, that those were clean things that you could consume. And, and my kid jumped right in and popped one in his mouth and ate it. He said, tastes like cod liver oil, Dad. <laughs> well, cod liver oil we take because we're Western Price people and we take fermented cod liver oil. And interesting, the, the, the grasshopper eats the plants which when the cows eats the plants, the levels of omega fatty acids increase. And here the grasshopper tasted like cod liver oil to my son. I thought it was interesting. Well, I just mentioned that because it says small animals and insects. Probably most of us don't consume insects, but if you're my child, you do. And then we would find him hunting them, crawling around in the grass, and eating them. I'm like, doesn't seem to be hurting him. Um, so again, this is not your, your, your usual nutrition advice. Uh, they spent a lot of time promoting, I'm kind of jumping around, but in the fat topic, these designer oils from plant-based things. None of those are stable for shelf life. Now you could use them fresh if you freshly pressed them and use them and they'd have some benefit. But what, we, what, what is brought to us is chemically treated and heat treated to make it shelf stable and basically ruined of any value that it has. So animal products were priced. Um, and it, it's significant that, that um, he found no groups that was building and maintaining good bodies exclusively on, on plant foods. I mean, we, we've had um, probably any one of you who've been concerned about nutrition at some point thought about plant-based diets. But these people who were living healthy, robust lives were not eating that kind of diet. Yeah, they may have been eating smaller amounts of meat and larger amounts of fat, and, but they weren't, they weren't sustained on a veg vegetarian, vegan-type diet. It just didn't occur. Um, I don't mean to step on anyone's toes if that's what you're about. Yes, sir. whether it be in a daily basis, weekly, annual? If he does, I have not read that. And I'll tell you just from experience is this, my opinion, I mean, I'm not a small human being. I mean, we have caloric needs based on our biological system that we are. And mine would be different than, you know, a woman who's this tall. Um, but I find that it's nowhere near what we consume as Americans. I mean, we're, we are satiated with all kinds of stuff that we don't really need. And, and, my, and from what I understand from all of this, it, it has more to do with the fact that the stuff that we consume is void of nutrients. It's not nutrient-dense food that we consume. Um, he, did a, he did do a study in Africa. Okay. Of, like all hunters. These were the same group of people. But one was all hunters, one was farmers, mostly yes. get mostly food, and the other was kind of a combination. And the all hunters had the best body build and uh, nutrition and just general health, as opposed to the farmers who were getting most of their nutrition from plant foods. Yes. So he did do this comparison okay. and found that result. I do know that um, the Inuit people, um, in the uh, the Indians in in North America and Canada, you know their diets were predominantly 85 percent saturated fat. They ate whale blubber and they had seal oil, and they had a smaller portions of meat. In my opinion, you're better off if you can buy the right meat from the right farmer to get a good chunk of fat with it. And 
Uh, th there, are, there are some articles about how fat actually helps healthy teeth here recently. Um, it may have been the last journal, if I'm remembering correct, but sometimes my, like today when I forget my cod liver oil, my gray matter struggles to remember everything the way I could, but it also could be kids. Um, so after the primitive people switched to foods of commerce, they, started, they first started noticing this situation. Dental caries in the facial and dental arches, deformities, feet, pelvis. This is kind of um, re repeating itself. Uh, my, my wife is in, in modern medicine and labor and delivery and obstetric nursing. And here I am the rogue guy that wants to eat the plants that are growing in the lawn and, you know, and take the goose off, you know, off the back of the property and use the fat. And anyway, so at times there's a little friction, but my wife grew up in, in a... Uh, Rural situation where they grew their food, they grew their own, they had their own cow, they had their own hog, they grew their own plants. And I grew up in the city. And if you just look at the formation of my wife's um, bones in her face and stuff, very different. I mean, I, I had the luxury food that cheated me of the development that, you know, and, and if, you, if you get really into this and you start looking around, I mean, and, you can just see the way small little chins, and he talks about this. I don't know if we're going to get to it. I'm going to have to watch my my time here. Um, um, so we struggle sometimes because I'm pretty hardcore about it, or I wouldn't probably be standing here. Um, and uh, she, I'm telling my kids, you know, you don't want to eat candy. You want to eat things that nourish your body, that strengthen you, keep your health so you can work, you can think, you can be productive, and, uh, and she kind of tells that story, you know, and, and you look at the development of, of her physical structure versus mine, where we had a little more money, we had a little more luxury, we ate maybe more candy and Doritos and junk, and my development is different. I have a narrower face. And my children, you can see as I learned the different development in their bone structure, which is crazy to me. I mean, I don't know if I'm imagining it, but my daughter has a narrower head, a smaller face. She was the firstborn. And then my other son and my, my youngest son has a real blocky, big head, perfect teeth, wide as could be, no problem. Anyway, um, I'm kind of just giving a little bit of a personal experience. Um, it says that the, the de degeneration begins after parents abandon their native food. And... Complications of pregnancy increase. That, um, we, we have a lot of problems with pregnancies in our modern times of infertility and, and lots of different other things. I know that, that because I'm married to a woman that's a nurse that works in those things. Um, so they had... Um, yeah, here we go. They had, um, they had special diets for young women and sometimes men before they even gotten married and pregnant and nursing mothers. They had preconception diets. And um, they, they understood something about how even when those eggs are given to form uh, the offspring, that they had to have uh, a, a, a nutrient-dense based diet to make that the best situation it could. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you've ever read... Um, Pottinger's cats, and you, you think about what went on there. Um, when, when those cats came to the place of degeneration after being fed ill nutrition, it took them, I believe it was four generations, to recover from that and regain the genetic strengths that they had and all kinds of disorders that the cats had after they were fed this... this um, messed up diet. Oh boy. Um, so this is just a breakdown of some of the different foods that the people consumed in the different areas. I always thought, uh, um, as I search, you know, okay, uh, I, I got to have this to be healthy or I got to have that. But here I live inland. I mean, were we forsaken if we're inlanders? No. I mean, they, they had different diet, and yes, they did go to the coast if they were inland at times to get the, the nutrients needed for these pregnancy diets. But it was usually prenatal or nursing moms, and they, they went pretty good distances. 
um, to acquire the rich seafoods and the egg, fish eggs and things, the fats that they needed for that. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, mean, I, don't, I, I haven't, I've never been pregnant, um, but I don't know what they tell women. Do they tell you to eat a low-fat diet? But I believe they've told pregnant women that that's completely crazy to tell a pregnant woman to eat a low-fat diet. That's exactly the opposite of what is needed from what is presented in his research that he found. I don't mean to be too sarcastic or cynical, but um, uh, I, I have a lot of passion about this. Um, nutrients found in fish eggs. Um, and you see, you know, just chuck full of things. And so this is one of the reasons why they traveled to get those things. And I apologize if I'm going kind of fast on this. I don't really know how I could do that effectively otherwise. Um, interval between children, two and a half to four years, allowing their bodies to recover from the draw that pregnancy and nursing and all that was. Um, that was planned out by some of these people. They had more ideas and more wisdom about stuff than what well, we're supposedly more educated today. We supposedly have so many more resources. It's interesting we're looking back now, or some of us are, to understand what they did. Um, they allowed the mothers to rebuild nutrition. So how do we apply this to our own lives? Um, we get over our aversion to organ meats and bones. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I've actually at one time tried raw venison liver I don't recommend it, but uh, but I tried it. I mean, it was like eating blood pudding. It was horrible. But but I mean, I have eaten raw things and even meats, um, and bones. I mean, broths that you make from bones, phenomenal, um, phenomenally packed with nutrient density. Um, they use the whole animal: organs, meats, muscles, mat, feet, uh, meat, fat. They made bones into broth. They they didn't buy skinless, boneless, prepackaged from a store. I, I, you know, I have chickens, and people have said, well, don't pluck the feathers. That's just a waste of your time and energy, and it's just annoying, and just skin them. I'm like, no, 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 I, I want the skin, and I want the fat that is under the skin, and I want that stuff in my food and in my broth. I don't want to eliminate that. Um, these are things that are, are, are valuable um, stuff for our health. Um, you get your animal products from farms. Here we're at the, we're, we're, this is why this is very relevant, I believe, here for today, um, where the animals eat food appropriate for their species and allowed plenty of time in pastures, because we all know probably who, if you're in this room now, that pasture-based animals produce a different product, a healthier product. Uh, some people may argue some different aspects of it, but I'm not really here for that. I mean, one guy might say he feeds X amount of corn to finish out, I'm, I don't want to bicker about minute details, but um, it's a different product in the field versus a feedlot. Um, it, it, it has an effect on the animal. So the, the groups uh, price study didn't eat factory farm animals. It just wasn't what they eat. They were hunter-gatherer type people, and they had a cleaner environment back in those times even now than we are today. So I don't even know if hunting is serving me the way I hope it is. Um, but it is better probably than what's on the shelf in a lot of places. Pastured animals are healthier. They have <clears throat> higher levels of the fat-soluble vitamins, which are hard to acquire otherwise. Um, he, he analyzed many samples of milk at various times of the year, which we would call pastured butter or spring grass milk and fall grass milk with the higher level of mega fatty acid in it. That's why I believe we inland people weren't forsaken. There was a thing for us, and it, was, it came from the uh, systems of things that, that we had available to us. Um, this principle applies to eggs and fat and organ meats. This is talking more about um, the different people that he visited, and you know, in the Swiss dairy was big, um, cheese, butter, and milk, as well as um, sourdough, rye bread, and little meat and green vegetables. Um, so, 
They used what was available to them. They farmed it in an appropriate manner, and they had a robust health from it. Um, I'm a big sourdough rye bread guy. I, I do that. Um, that's all I eat. I don't buy shelf bread at the store. Every now and then we might buy from one bakery in town that I trust because I know they're actually fermenting their dough. Um, but I would never buy any of the other stuff personally. I'd probably just fast for a while. Um, lots of dangers to those grains that aren't treated appropriately. If you want to talk more about that, we can, you can come by or we can talk later. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, he tested the levels of vitamins and minerals found in the milk, and it was much higher than commercial milk in the U.S. and Europe. A friend of mine likes to call the milk that we have on the shelf liquid sheetrock. Why is it even allowed to be called milk? Because of the things that they do to deteriorate that product. The cows and the... And, and, and I'll say, I understand it's complicated. It's like, how do we get clean water? Yeah, we don't want chlorine, and we don't want... All fluoride, but it's it's a complicated issue to bring water to millions of people to that's potable, and then the same with food. So, is even though I'm pretty hardcore, I understand the complexity of making this happen. <clears throat> the cows and the goats ate higher quality hay in the winter and grazed on green grass growing from very fertile soil in the summer. We have a problem with our soil because of our agriculture. Um, it, it needs to be reworked to produce the foods that we need. But these are some of the pictures of um, people who, um, I think this is a comparative photo. If I'm remembering it, pardon me for this is, I'm going to stumble through this for a second. Um, these are uh, isolated and modern Swiss. So here's a picture of some of the children from this valley and they had no cavities and very straight teeth with well-formed faces. And were able to play outside barefoot in, in weather that caused Dr. Price and his wife to wear heavy overcoats. So, uh, you, you know, and, and even said that being said, you, you consider the Amish. I mean, they, they wear shoes only when they have to. And now the, the, the modern Amish obviously are an isolated people group, so they're being, um, you know, they've been influenced too much by the West, and they're having problems. But still, they have a different lifestyle that makes them more robust than most of us. Um, I, I like to be able to compare things that you can observe currently along with what he said now. Um, and this particular photo is isolated modern Swiss and children in other parts of Switzerland that had um, exposure to modern foods. Crowded teeth, narrow faces, and the rampant tooth decay. Um, Pottinger's Cat Study, if you haven't seen it, it's worth checking out because it's another verification of this idea. So how can I apply this to my own life? You eat whole unprocessed foods, avoid package, avoid refined foods of all kinds. And it means that you got to cook. I mean, we spent hours in our kitchen and my family believing that it's, it's worth our time. Um, I spend, I mean, the kids are in bed, my wife is exhausted, and I'm at the counter feeding my sourdough, um, messing with my cultured milk or my water kefir, or cultured vegetables, and I go to bed a little later, but I have the strength to do it. Um, is my health perfect? No. I'm not where I'd like to be, but I'm way better than I was 10 years ago from applying these principles. Um, getting to know your farmer. It's absolute must. I mean, a, a guy approached me and said, how, how, do we, how do we know? I said, you gotta know, you got to know your farmer. I mean, I don't, I don't know that we can even really rely on stores. And I don't, I don't want to be too hard on that because I don't want to create any bad feelings between the stores. But, but what comes in there, even in organics, is questionable. Questionable. And, and, and a lot of it is the same problem that other food. Politics have played a role in that. Um, you know, one guy said, I wish I had a Brinks measure, you know, that I could go in there and crush up the produce and put it in there. 
no thanks. <laughs> You're charging me that much for that, you know, because it's, quote, organic, but I think I'll pass because um, the nutrient density is what's really important. Um, so you want, you know, your meat, your eggs, your butter, your milk from pasture to animals and vegetables grown without pesticides and herbicides. And hopefully the system of growing the vegetables is managed in a biologically dynamic, living, natural system. I'll just say that instead of organic. I don't have anything against organic personally. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But, but I think it maybe describes it a little better. It would be like um, if, 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 you're, if you sat in any of the Judy's talks, you know, a grass-fed. Well, well, every cattle eats grass. But what is grass finished? You know, there's a different product. Um, more pictures here. You just, it, it, it's showing the broad, broad jaw, chin and jaw, and, and wide arches that they had. I mean, you compare me to that. I have a narrow little face. I grew up with luxury food. It did me wrong. Um, and these are obviously people that were very exposed to Western diet and just, few generations they're just I don't know if you're familiar that every seven years I believe the skeletal system kind of replaces itself so you either go in a positive direction or a negative one and, and there it is <clears throat> look at that I mean it's beautiful well, look at that guy's mouth and his teeth and and he also found that there was a lot of um, um, significance to <coughs> excuse me, the genetic characteristics that were strongly maintained were a certain people group, even though they weren't related siblings, they looked like they were brother and sister because of this strong line of genetics and the nutrition. That's, I mean, I don't know if it's this photo, but there's one where they, they look like they're all one family, but they're not. They're just a certain group of people from a, a certain area in the world. We might argue that there was a small <clears throat> crowd of people that maintained their just more pictures of of the strong, strong features that that remain. There you go. I love this photo. Look at that guy's heart from that guy. You know, I mean, and their cheekbones are big and. A lot of people argue it's just genetics, but I, I just don't really believe that. I don't. I don't. Um, I don't think so. Uh, so, a take-home message, and then if you have some questions, we can talk a little bit. Is everyone needs real nutrient? <clears throat> excuse me. Nutrient-dense foods with plenty of fat-soluble vitamins, especially would-be parents, pregnant women, and children. Real animal fats, saturated fats, and cholesterol are not necessarily bad for you. Um, refined, damaged foods not only don't have, <clears throat> excuse me, value for our body, they just place the foods that do and harm the body. Um, one example of that is if you are consuming grains that have these germination inhibitors in them because of how we operate our conventional agriculture, those are anti-nutrients that you're consuming. Sourdough process, the fermentation process, <clears throat> breaks down the phytate acid, what is it, which is a nutrient binder, a sense, or it, 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 it prevents absorption of other nutrients that you eat in your body and leaches them. Well, wow, you know, okay, well, who cares about sourdough bread and whether I have the gluten broken down and the phytate, but when you know that the raw cheese that you may have eaten, or, or even regular cheese or butter, there's something in it. I mean, it's not completely void. But when it's tying up those things, all of a sudden it's a big problem. And it's a cumulative situation, not just this, but all the environmental hazards that we have to deal with in our modern time. So it displaces the foods that do, and it harms the body in numerous ways. I mean, we know, we know what's going on. I mean, we're all alive. We're aware of cancer. I mean, how many diabetic people do you know, even young people? And how many people do you know with heart disease? 
quality matters, healthy animals and plants grown in healthy soil have more nutrients. It's just the way it is. Um, it's overwhelming if you're starting from scratch. Because someone came to me yesterday and said, I have this situation, what do I do? And I'm scratching my head, how do I encourage this person? You know, I said, let's kind of give a real simple thing and say, let's avoid too many grains. Let's eat more appropriate fats. You know, I kind of broke this thing down, and, and then you have that look, the, the addiction look. Well, I was talking just earlier with the guy at the, at the thing that, you know, <clears throat> food that are void of nutrients kind of cause this addictive behavior. Your body has to have a certain nutrient um, intake. So if the food that you eat doesn't have that and all it has is calories, you're putting on weight, that's secreting hormones. I mean, it, it's complicated, and you just get in this vicious cycle. Somewhere you have to break it if you really want to live healthy and right. Um, it, it starts on the farm, and it comes then to you and how you um, process it and take care of it. Uh, okay, thank you. Weston Price is a non-for-profit organization. It's about teaching and research. Um, it's, run by, it's run by donations, and it's run by, we obviously sell things. I apologize. <clears throat> it's dusty in here, and my health isn't completely where I want it, so I'm struggling a little. We're, we're, it's dedicated to storing nutrient-dense foods in the human diet through education, research, and activism. <clears throat> so, um, accurate nutri nutrition information, organic and biodynamic farming, pasture feeding, livestock, community-supported farms, honest and informative labeling, prepared parenting, and nurturing therapies. This is some of the supportive work of Weston A. Price. The core belief is that modern technology should be harnessed as a servant to the wise and nurturing traditions of our ancestors rather than used as a force destructive to the environment, the human health, and that science and knowledge can validate those traditions. So there is a role for them to come together. How that all occurs has to be through people. Um, I've, I've gone round and round, um, even with doctors who have studied way more than me. And I don't know, I mean, their IQ may be off the charts compared to mine. I don't know. I, I don't really care. Um, but brought people to the, just to a, a place of thought that, that we've kind of just stumbled into this spot where we are now. Some well intended and some maybe done in an evil manner, you know, I, mean, it, I believe that probably lots of things started out well intended and then money took over um, without mentioning any specific names. Um, but, but we have to teach people about it. The, the one individual person is a medical doctor and he had lots of ailments and I said, hey, let's consider this, let's try this, let's, and it kind of, he wasn't close-minded to it, but but he started trying some things, and he was very skeptical. And a few weeks later, something that I suggested was elderberry. And he came back. He goes, I would have thought you were crazy. And probably if his wife wouldn't have been there, he would never have gotten it from the store. But she kind of nudged him. He goes, I can't tell you the difference in my, my malady that I have. I mean, phenomenal difference. So we want to we nudge people. We want to encourage people. We want to pass the passion along, if you will.